Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on social media at MMALOTN. This week, we're, well, not this week, we got a triple header this week, and this is going to be the second of the three podcasts that I dropped for you guys. On this second episode, we're going to be going over Bellator 294. Now, earlier this week, I said that I do a joint episode between 294 and 295, but this card, as well as the LFA card, is taking me a little bit longer to get through in terms of studying. So rather than just withholding the information and keep it strictly for my Patreon folks, I thought I would drop this 294 breakdown now that I got it wrapped up. And as I get through the 295 breakdown, you guys will have access to that by Friday late afternoon, um, probably closer to the evening time as well. But I'll have all of the fights broken down for you guys. But I thought I might as well split it up. The reason I wanted to put them together is because I didn't want my 200th episode, which is going to be the next one, to be a Bellator card. I wanted it to be the UFC card. But it is what it is. We're stuck with Bellator being the 200th episode, which is going to be the next one that I drop tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'll do... I'm not going to say I'm going to do something special for it, but I'd like to do a little bit of a retrospective at the beginning of that. Just you know, talking about the prior 200 episodes and how we got here and all that. So make sure you guys look out for that. But we are talking about Bellator 294 this weekend, which is headlined by a uh, women's flyweight fight or flyweight title fight, I should say, between Liz Carmouche and Deanna Bennett, uh, a rematch of a fight that uh, actually took place, which was the uh, Bellator debut of both women, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that Liz Carmouche ended up winning. Uh, Weigh-ins were this morning. Deanna Bennett misses weight. But the title is still on the line, meaning if Liz Carmouche wins, she retains her title. If Liz Carmouche loses, the belt is vacant and Deanna Bennett has no chance to win the title. So it's a very unfortunate situation with what transpired there. But hopefully Liz Carmouche gets her hand raised regardless so we don't have too many issues going on with that fight. All right, um, normally I do the recap for the prior event, but I already did that earlier this week. So I just don't want to quickly remind you guys, LFA breakdown strictly on the Patreon, link in the description below. That goes down Friday night, a great card going down there. I believe they have a title fight on that card as well. So if you guys want access to those breakdowns, Patreon link in the description below. And if you want to see the Bellator breakdowns for tomorrow's card as they're dropping, which they will be over the next 24 hours, even before the public gets a hold of them with the video version of it that I'll be dropping on the YouTube, you can find that on the Patreon too. Link in the description below. And then I'll have all my following UFC card breakdowns done for you guys by Sunday evening. Again, I don't drop the podcast on Monday so you guys get early access to those breakdowns as well. A ton of great things on the Patreon. Check out the link in the description below. All right, let's get into this nine-fight card that we got for Bellator 294. First fight of the night between Anthony Adams and Sharaf Davlet Muradov. Uh, we'll start off on the Adams side, who I believe has a one in one record in Bellator now. He made his debut with a big upset victory over Khalid Murtazaliev in a fight. I believe he was around that plus 300, plus 400 range. But uh, if you had told me before that fight that Murtazaliev would not seek a grapple heavy approach like he normally does, I would have probably put some money on Anthony Adams. Adams is a solid striker, I believe, coming from a Muay Thai background. And you can see that in the way that he fights. He throws one, two combinations. He usually ends off his combinations with kicks. He throws, like I said, great combinations, good footwork. Obviously, the part that's lacking in his game is probably his takedown defense. And you saw that on full display when Khalid finally went for takedowns at the end of that fight. And even in the Dalton Rasta fight, who was able to secure a couple of takedowns in that matchup. But Adams only has 12 fights to his name to this point, but did start his um, MMA career pretty late considering his professional debut came at the age of 28. He now finds himself at 35 years old and uh, he's had a good amount of experience throughout his career even though he's only had 12 fights uh, over the last seven years. But solid striker, good overall fighter, but I feel like this is a bad matchup for him against the uh, you know, the Russian uh, heavy uh, grappling approach from Davlat Muradov that he's going to be seeing this weekend. Davlat Muradov made his Bellator debut against, uh, you know, soon to be or who had just recently fought for his title, Anatoly Tokov, and went to a split decision with him. It was a close fight. Davlat had his or Davlat Muradov had his own success in that matchup. I'd say that Tokov got the better of the grappling realm, but it wasn't by a landslide by any means. Hell, Davlat Muradov actually ended off in the top position at the ending of that matchup by reversing a very good position from Tokov there and doing some good enough damage of his own from that top spot. And that's his game. He goes out there, 
takes you to the ground, and he grinds you out. He's been training over there in Thailand for the last couple of years, mainly at Tiger Muay Thai. You see him actually training with champion uh, Vadim Nemkov at times as well. Um, very solid fighter with a good wealth of experience under his belt. You know what he's going to bring to the table here, and I think it's just going to be far too much for Anthony Adams. I think Davlat Murda. Davlat Muradov is a very good spot to kick off the card here. I get he's chalky, but I think he's going to end up looking like that chalk, especially if he goes out there and brings a grapple-heavy approach, as I expect him to. Next up, we got Chris Lencioni going up against Blake Smith. Both guys missing weight here, but not as egregiously as Lencioni, who actually missed weight by six pounds, I believe it was. Not a good look for him at all, but uh, hopefully... That plays out in his favor because I think that this is a good matchup for him. Now, Blake Smith is a solid striker, former CFFC champion who just recently lost his title and now makes his Bellator debut. But he's a guy that goes out there, puts his one-twos down the pipe very fast with his hands and has a decent wrestling background or a decent wrestling game if that's what he needs to win his fights. However, top control, not the greatest. I've seen him reverse. I've seen him get taken down himself. Cardio, a little bit of a, a sketchy part of his game as well you know i think the wins that he has hasn't really been super impressive uh especially against the level of competition he's been winning against but when you see him fighting legitimate regional guys like the chris browns and the kenley st louis that's when you see him actually end up taking his losses and he's getting that this weekend in a guy like chris glincioni who has a lot of solid experience under his belt as well this is a guy who has pulled off a big upset in his last matchup against cody law in a fight where he did get taken down every now and then but did good enough work in terms of working off of his back landing enough damage and even doing good damage while they're in the standing position to end up getting his hand raised by decision in that night uh, in that matchup he's a very awkward striker and i saw one of my guys actually on twitter recently uh tweet out that they, he reminds him of a, a poor man's brandon royval and i think that's a great way to approach it he creates a little bit of chaos in the cage that some fighters are unable to keep up with which end up making them lose their fight anyway and I think that Lencioni can do the same thing here to Blake Smith. He might get taken down. He might get touched up on the feet a little bit. But I think that Lencioni's awkward style will provide some resistance that Blake Smith will not be able to keep up with. Not to mention, the big weight miss here for Lencioni will probably benefit him in the grappling realm in this matchup. So even if Blake Smith looks to take him to the ground, look for that active guard to come into play. Look for reversals. Look for get-ups. And look for Lencioni to be dishing out damage throughout this fight. The fact that he missed by six pounds and uh, Blake smith missed by like half a pound shows you that blake probably was the one killing himself to make the weight whereas lencioni more so was just eh, i don't want to cut the weight it's all good so very weird circumstance there but i'm gonna go with lencioni here and i think he could possibly even pull off a submission in this matchup Next up, we're going to be talking about Tyrell Fortune going up against Bellator debutante Sergei Bilosteni. Uh, Tyrell Fortune, unfortunately, uh, I believe coming up, yeah, coming off a loss to Daniel James, who just picked up a recent big win as a Bellator main event over Marcelo Gome. But that was a fight where the first round looked like a Tyrell Fortune fight. Got him to the ground, got a, a solid position up against the cage, landed some good ground and pound, got the neck of Daniel James, but was unable to finish it off. And that's where things start to go wrong for Taro Fortune. As Daniel James was able to reverse the position with seconds remaining in that first round, land some good ground and pound from that top position. And then in the beginning of the second round, find that nasty uppercut that drops Taro Fortune and puts him away. But Tyro Fortune, we know that his striking game is always something that he needs to work on. It's been his wrestling game that gets him his wins whenever he does get his hand raised. And I think that's going to be very important for him in this matchup this weekend against Sergei uh, Bilosteni. I'm still going to take a while to try to figure out this guy's name. Bellisteni is a striker of a Russian, not so much of a grappler, but likes to use his fast hands, utilizes good footwork. He's very light on his feet and is very fast with his hands, especially in the combinations that he throws early in fights. But when guys are able to wrap him up, take him to the ground, or even just wear on him, that's where you see that advantage normally start to taper off. And he can beat some of the guys that he's going up against, like the aging Brazilians that he's been facing over his last couple of fights, or he ends up losing to guys that are able to take him to the ground and hold him there and i think that's what we're going to see here from tyrell fortune i get it it's a little scary to bank on tyrell fortune considering he just got knocked out by a striker powerful striker albeit and uh bill Steny, 
a striker in his own right. But I feel like the size advantage and the grappling advantage that Tyro Fortune will have here will allow him to stay out of trouble against Sergey, drag this fight to the ground, and maybe even open up a finishing opportunity of his own in the second or third round of this matchup. Sergey's gas tank, sketchy. Tyro Fortune's not that much better, but I believe the grappling advantage he's going to have in this fight will allow for him to assert his dominance and eventually get that finish. So give me Tyro Fortune. I wouldn't even be surprised to see him pull off a submission either, considering the fact that he's been actively working and competing in world grappling tournaments, which he just actually won uh, a couple months back, if I'm not mistaken. So keep your eyes out on the BJJ improvements of Tyrell Fortune going into this matchup. Next up, we got Kilis Mota going up against Kenneth Cross. And this was a fight where I really thought that Kenneth Cross would, uh, or sorry, um, uh, Achilles Moto would be my spot in this fight you know he had a decent enough striking game but something that he's been leaning on over his last two matchups is his grappling he's been very strong in terms of tying his opponents up dragging them to the ground and just staying relentless from that top position with ground and pound with transitions and just always getting that dominant position where he's able to just take his time and just dish out damage he's been reversed he's been you know opponents have been able to get up but he's done a good job in terms of dragging them back down into that position kenneth cross on the other side is a guy who has a solid winning streak going for him a guy that was on the contender streets but was unimpressive in his victory and did not get signed but still has managed to rattle off two victories after that contender series uh, appearance he's a guy with another strong wrestling background of his own and he's a guy that comes up with actual wrestling background whereas Kili Smolta more so started to lean into the wrestling when he saw how dominant it could be or dominant it could be with the strength and skill set that he has however if this plays out in this grappling realm I gotta lean with the Kenneth Cross side here as I believe he is the better technical wrestler as long as his cardio holds up which I think might even be a little bit better than Kili Smolta here he should be able to get the better positions right out that top time get some good damage off from that top position and win this fight by decision the spot that I have concern with is Kelis Mota has been more active. Kelis Mota has the better striking. And Kelis Mota is probably improving at a decent rate, especially with the time that he's spending over there at Teixeira MMA and Fitness. But I expect this to be a grappling-heavy affair. And we've seen Kelis Mota succumb to that in the past. If Kenneth Cross can get that going here, I feel that he is very live to pull off the upside here, especially in his Bellator debut. So give me Kenneth Cross and Kenneth Cross by decision. Next up, we got Levon Chokeli going up against Michael Lombardo. Another spot that I feel like the underdog is pretty good in this fight. Now, Levon is coming off of giving Roman Feraldo his first ever professional MMA loss in a fight that he leaned on his grappling, took him to the ground over and over again, grounded him out. You know, I believe he might have lost that second round, but did a good enough job in terms of coming back in that third and getting that decision victory. Normally, Levon is going out there and just starching these guys in the first round. And that was the first nine victories in his professional MMA career. It's just knocking everybody out in the first round. And that's what you're going to get when you're fighting that sketchy regional scene from where he came up in. But as you see him starting to fight, you know, tougher competition, that's where he ends up coming up short, right? I believe it was... Um, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head who was the first guy to give him his loss. Um, I know he's lost to Gaioti. Oh, yeah, Kyle Crutchmer and uh, Gaioti Yamauchi. Like, it's like his one punch style in the first round is not going to work against those guys. His grappling, not good enough to hang with those guys, as he found out. And I think that's the trouble he's going to run into this matchup with the Michael Lombardo. I think Lombardo, he's great at everything, or he's good at everything. He's an American top team product with good striking. He does a great job in terms of staying patient and disciplined while he's in the pocket exchanging with his opponents, which is why he was able to come out with that knockout victory over Mark Leminger. You see him keeping his eye on his target while his opponent is throwing at him, and that allows him to uncork on a three-punch combination that allows him to see his target, land on the target, and drop his target and get his hand raised in that aspect. He pulled off the upset that night and use my dog of the night prediction that night and he's going to be my dog of the night prediction this weekend as well as i believe that if he can survive that early you know knockout power of chokeli i expect him to take over the longer that this fight goes he has better cardio and he might get taken down in this matchup i i believe that levon could have the better wrestling here but i don't think that levon will be able to deal with that get up game and the reversals that lombardo will be able to hit in this matchup keeping up that resistance keeping up that high activity pace i think we see levon start to slow down and i think we see lombardo possibly finish him in the, him in the latter half of this matchup the under two and a half which is still at plus money 
I think is a damn good spot as well. People are expecting Levant to go out there and grind out Lombardo over 15 minutes, given where the odds are all at. But I just don't think that's going to happen. I think Lombardo provides enough resistance to keep this as a high activity fight, which will either produce an early Levant knockout or a late stoppage via TKO by Lombardo. I'm going to go with the latter here, and I think he pulls off the upset. Give me Michael Lombardo via round three TKO. Next up, Danny Sabatello returns after getting eliminated from the Grand Prix by the interim champion Rafian Stotz, and he takes on a pretty hot prospect in Marcos Breno, who made his statement in his Bellator debut over Josh Hill. He pulled off a big upset victory that night as he you could tell within the first minute of that fight that he was going to win that fight he was putting the pressure on josh hill landing his more crisper and faster strikes more damaging and stinging strikes as well and you could see that josh was like oh fuck i gotta either get this fight to the ground or try to get some respect back on the feet there's no way he was going to get the second because josh has never been that amazing striker anyway and whenever he tried for the takedowns he ended up coming up short and we knew that breno was going to be able to take over for the rest of that matchup good slick strike his only or at least most recent loss came at the hands of Taylor Lapalus, who now finds himself back in the UFC and that night Taylor Lapalus was just the faster and more crafty striker that Breno was unable to get a beat on him the one part of Breno's game that we haven't really seen him challenged in recently is the grappling and he's going to be fighting a tough grappler and Danny Sabatello this weekend and obviously you expect Danny Sabatello to be a pretty big favorite in this matchup and even though I like Sabatello to win this fight because it's hard to deal with that Sabatello style of just relentless takedowns and relentless forward pressure we got to be wary about the threat that breno brings to the table breno is still carving out a spot for himself in the bellator roster and he seems to have the potential to be a pretty you know solid addition to this bantamweight division he's gonna have the uh striking background here and if you can at least keep the activity high enough keep some uh, get-ups coming or some reversals coming and beat up danny stabatello on the feet he could have some success but we know that Sabatello grind is a completely different thing that not a lot of fighters are really prepared for. And I expect Sabatello to go out there, grind his way to a decision win, and uh, yeah, get right back into the talk of being one of the top bantamweights in Bellator. But uh, I do like Sabatello here, just a little bit weary about it, considering the, pot- the potential of Marcos Breno. Next up, we got Arlene Blenko going up against Sarah McMahon. Yes, Sarah McMahon makes her Bellator debut this weekend after going out on a win over Carol Hotza, who also fights this weekend for the UFC. And it was kind of surprising for a lot of people that Sarah McMahon decided to forego her UFC contract and get to the Bellator ranks. But I believe that Bellator is probably throwing her a little extra cheddar. And the fact that Sarah McMahon is at 42 years old, she knows she's not touching UFC gold. And she knows she'll likely make more money with Bellator over the next couple fights that she ends up fighting for this promotion. We know what Sarah brings to the table. Her silver medalist in uh, wrestling uh, from the Olympics. She wants to take her opponents to the ground, grind them out from on top, look for that arm triangle choke, or just look to maintain position long enough that if the fight does go to a decision, she does enough to win the first two rounds. Where her issue comes is her cardio and her lack of striking. And that's where you see fighters have a lot of success in that third round. And that's why you see the majority of losses on Sarah McMahon's record come from the fact that she ends up dropping the latter half of the fight either getting finished in the second or third round or losing a decision by just dropping the second and third rounds but she's very difficult to deal with in the early goings when she is uh when she's dry when she has all of her strength when she has all of her energy it's hard to stop those takedowns on the blend cow side she's come up short in a couple very close fights obviously <clears throat> excuse me not sure what happened there um, in her last two losses, she obviously came up short against Chris Cyborg, but in her two fights against Julia Butt, the second of which being for a title, a lot of people believe that she deserved to win both of those fights, especially that second one. She did a great job in terms of stopping the takedowns of Julia Budd, keeping that fight in the upright position, and landing great damage whenever they were out at range. And that's what I'm expecting her to do here against Sarah McMahon. Now, I get it. Sarah is probably going to be the best wrestler that Arlene Blenkow has fought. However, if Blenkow can stay safe enough in the first round and avoid getting submitted or avoid getting put in a bad enough position where she'll get ground and pounded, I think that she could start to take over in the second and third rounds with her superior striking. 
that's her background. She's a very good kickboxer in terms of throwing straight shots down the middle, as we saw on full display when she knocked out Diana Silva a couple fights back. And if she can keep that here, utilize that striking to maintain her distance, pivot out from uh, bad positions up against the cage, and keep Sarah McMahon working, she can get that McMahon gas tank on E or close to E and really start to take over and possibly even find a knockout for herself in the latter half of this matchup. I'm going to go with Blanca as the underdog in this spot as it's hard to trust uh, Sarah McMahon at this stage in her career. And I get it. Blanca is up there in age as well. She's 40 years old. Not as old as Sarah McMahon, who's 42 years old. But we are seeing constant improvements from Marlene Blanca every time she fights. Even in her last matchup, which was a year removed from the fact that she just fought for the title against Chris Cyborg and went the full five rounds. She didn't get dusted as most Chris Cyborg opponents normally get dusted. She did a good job, made a great account of herself, and I feel like she's still one of the top women in the Bellator featherweight division. And she's going to give Sarah McMahon a rude awakening to her Bellator debut. So give me Arlene Blancow, third round, TKO. I believe next up is the, yes, co-main event, which takes place in the heavyweight division. And it's between two heavyweights that are on a bit of a drought. We got Timothy Johnson going up against Saeed Soma. And uh, starting on the Johnson side, he did get finished in his last two fights. It's unfortunate considering how he was doing pretty well. Putting together a solid three-fight winning streak before he ended up uh, getting that title shot against Vital or not against Vital Minikov against uh, Valentin Moldovsky. He ended up losing that fight by decision, but he did get finished in his last fight. Sorry, I just want to confirm. You know what? We got phones nowadays. Why, why are we even bothering by looking at the screen when I can just quickly pull it up here? Um, but yeah, I know Timothy Johnson unfortunately got finished um, one for sure by, I'm not sure why I'm having this complete mind blank right now. So he lost to uh, Valentin Moldovsky after his 3 fight winning streak. Uh, knocked out by Fedor Emelianenko and then last time knocked out by Linton Vassell a year ago at Bellator 277. Chin, a little bit of a question mark. But I don't think he's going to have to worry too much about that here with Saeed Somo, who's not a huge power puncher. He does have a couple of TKO finishes on his record from earlier in his career, but as he's been taking steps up in competition, he's one, either been losing, or two, not producing knockouts. He himself is on a two-fight losing streak where he's uh, dropped decisions uh, over his last two matchups, most recently against Gokan Sirichan, and his last fight, or the fight before that, which I can't recall off the top of my head, oh, against... Um, Davion Franklin, uh, those are fights where he just couldn't get much of his game going. I believe both those were split decision losses as well, but he didn't really do much to really stand out in that matchup. You know, he's a decent striker, he's a decent grappler, but he's not a, a really good at anything. You know, he's had a lot of hype on him for some reason, even though he dropped his be or professional MMA debut against Steve Maury, who's a top Bellator heavyweight at this point in time as well. But I still have my question marks in regards to how good he can actually be. And when he fights stiff competition, and Timothy Johnson, even though he's up there in age at this point, is stiff competition. If you can't knock out Timothy Johnson, he's going to put you to the ringer. And I'm expecting Timothy Johnson to do exactly that. I think that he'll get the better of the grappling exchanges whenever they tie up with each other. I think he has enough punching power to potentially knock out Saeed Soma himself. But as long as his chin holds up, I think he's the better overall fighter, even at this point in their career. So I think that Timothy Johnson is a good underdog spot for this weekend. Maybe not my most confident underdog spot on the card. I'll reserve that for Michael Lombardo. But I still believe that Timothy Johnson is going to be a tough, tough out for Soma. I think he grinds him out in those tough positions. I expect it to be boring. I expect it to be clinchy and grindy up against the cage. Maybe even some takedowns that Johnson's able to land. But I'm going to go with Johnson here to pull off the upset victory. And that brings us... To our main event of the evening between Liz Carmouche and Deanna Bennett. This is a rematch of a fight that took place back in 2020 where Liz Carmouche won the first round, lost the second round, but then ended up pulling off a victory in the third round by a rear naked choke and she was able to win that fight. Liz Carmouche has been flawless since joining the Bellator crew uh, or the team. I believe she's 5-0 now, which included her winning the title off of former title holder Juliana Vas Velasquez and defending the title against her as well, which sets her up now for her th second title defense against Deanna Bennett. Like I said at the top of the show, Deanna Bennett did miss weight, which is unfortunate, but... 
the, the title is still on the line for Liz Carmouche. She loses, it's vacant. She wins, she adds to her defending total. And that could be two if she gets her hand raised this weekend. Both women heavily rely on grappling opportunities to get their hand raised. That's how Deanna Bennett has been able to beat Justine Kish and Alejandra Lara over the last three fights. She beat Justine Kish twice. I'm not sure why they ended up doing the rematch considering that first fight wasn't that close at all anyway. Um, and then uh, she ended up losing her first Bellator fight by grappling. Now, Deanna Bennett has been around for a while. I believe it's going to be 10 years now since she's been competing in the game, maybe even longer than that. I could be off on that number. But she's had some good wins on her record throughout her career. Uh, Miranda Maverick, one of the wins that she has on her record. Juliana Pena, who she's been able to defeat in the past. Uh, Karina Rodriguez, even Jennifer Maya. But that's much earlier in her career. And now we're seeing, even though she's having some success in Bellator, she's going to come up short against fighters that have better grappling than her, which is what I expect Liz Carmouche to be showcasing this weekend. I think Liz is the better technical grappler especially in the wrestling realm and i think that the reason that deanna bennett had good success in that second round against her was the fact that she did a great job in terms of blending her uh takedown behind a combination and we see liz carmusha address that in her following fights she sees whenever fighters try hiding a takedown behind their strikes she's privy to it and she's able to stuff the takedown attempt get back out into range and get back to her game so if liz carmusha is actively thinking about that and knowing that okay that's where Deanna Bennett's takedowns are likely going to come from she can stuff those takedowns or eventually just get her own takedowns before Deanna Bennett is able to hit her own now mix in the fact that Deanna Bennett missed weight you got to believe that Liz Carmouche is in fantastic shape she should be able to go out there get the position she needs and I think she actually pulls off a submission victory as well so the under four and a half not a bad spot at plus money but specifically Carmouche by submission I think she replicates it once again in the rematch here and defends her title for the second time there you guys go breakdowns for all nine bellator 294 fights again reminder i will be back tomorrow to drop the bellator 295 breakdown for you guys We're more than enough in time to get your bets in for the saturday card so make sure you guys check that out a ton of other great content dropping out throughout the week i just dropped the lucky trinity uh segment so make sure you guys check that out three best prop bet segment comes out tomorrow as well both for obviously the ufc card that's going down this weekend and then if you guys want access to the lfa breakdown which goes down friday night as well that can be found on the patreon link in the description below appreciate every single one of you guys as always good luck on all your action this weekend and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for the three best prop bets and the bellator 295 predictions peace Last thing.